Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at Samparini Field in Torrance for the B-17 Flying Fortress. I'm a World War II pilot, but in a troop carrier. The uh, flight on this B-17 was awesome. We, we just had a wonderful time, and uh, everybody was so helpful and, uh, and uh, informative, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. Well, it's unusual today, but we took off to the east, which is unusual for this airport. We flew out over San Pedro and around the Palos Verdes Peninsula, circled around over the ocean, and then came in by our house in, in Hollywood Riviera, or South Redondo, and landed back at the airport. In World War II, I was a pilot with a troop carrier flying the hump from uh, uh, India to China and Burma. Hi, I'm L.J. Stogsdale. And I'm Mindy Stogsdale. And we flew on the B-17 today, and it was fantastic. Um, you know, we were flying down the coast at about 1,000 feet and over the ocean. So usually you never get that low where you could uh, experience the ground rushing by so fast. <laughs> yeah, and we uh, had the opportunity to walk throughout the plane while we were in flight and uh, could go to the back of the plane, the radio room, and then up towards the front on the flight deck, down a hatch, down into the bombardier bubble, and had a chair there. You could actually sit in the chair, <laughs> and it was a little bit scary at first, but um, seeing the ocean and the ground and just the view is fantastic, of course, with uh, uh, 360 degree up and above and around. Anyway, it was, it was just so beautiful, a be perfect day for it, too. And uh, I was in the Air Force and I was on transports, transports uh, with four engines. They were prop engines, so I remember spending like 12, 13 hours in the air. Uh, I was just part of the crew, I wasn't the pilot, but it took me back when you hear the engines start up. And uh, that's part of it, just the wonderful noise. And one of the things that really makes you think back is the thousands of planes that were lost early in the war over in Europe uh, with their crew and uh, the, the people that sacrificed their lives. And so uh, I just want to honor those people today and just think about them. Uh, and God bless those that are still around to talk about World War II and want to experience this. Back in uh, 1994 or 1993, I guess it was, we decided we want to start touring this aircraft around the United States. We realized that the uh, the uh, veterans from World War II, as Brokaw puts it, the generation that saved the world, uh, was starting to get pretty old and they were starting to die. And so we wanted, uh, as an organization, that's the Experimental Aircraft Association, we wanted to uh, take one last opportunity to honor the World War II veterans and to also go out and wave our flag and let people around the country know who the Experimental Aircraft Association uh, is, you know, who we are and, and what we're all about. Uh, we've been doing that since 1994 when we started our first tour. And uh, we've done it every year since, uh, going around the country, trying to hit as many states as we can, uh, and uh, inter introducing people to the B-17, honoring the veterans that, that flew them, uh, and, uh, and waving our flag. We did that this morning for four flights, 10 people each, so we had 40 people on board that had a chance to fly in the airplane. And then this afternoon, as soon as we're done here, we'll be opening the airplane up for ground tours and let the people that maybe can't afford to, uh, to spend the money that it costs, because it is not cheap to, to do this. Uh, obviously, it cost us $1,000 an hour just for gas to fly this airplane. Um, but we open it up for ground tours and families can come out and go through the airplane and, and uh, get a chance to see what the uh, inside of a World War II bomber is all about. You know, to maintain it in the condition that we 
feel is necessary to be able to, you got to understand, we leave Oshkosh the first or the last week of March, and, and except for a couple of maintenance stops, we don't bring a plane back home until the week uh, before Thanksgiving. So we spend about three and a half, four months of our winter really taking it apart, looking seriously at the engines, uh, at every system, and making sure that everything is 100% up to snuff, uh, because we don't want to get out on the road and then have things start falling apart. So we really, we go through every square inch of this airplane to make sure that everything is right. Well, for me, I think that it's an awesome experience to see the people's expressions, see the uh, the veterans. Um, I flew in two wars myself, so I understand what it's about and what it must be like for them at their fa at this phase of their life. So it's, it's a great treat for me, a real honor. How did you get interested in flying? Well, it started uh, early one morning on the farm when I was moving irrigation pipes. Looked up, freezing cold, wet from moving those 27-foot sections. An airplane flew over, and I said, it's got to be a better way to make a living. That started the whole thing. That's great. I flew in the uh, closing phases of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and then also in the first Desert Storm, Desert Shield. Operated the B-52 and uh, in Southeast Asia and the 141 in uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And... Uh, I guess what I would say about war is it's probably the most confusing event you'll ever attend in your life. That, to me, sums it up. The panel instruments very much were the same as they were during World War II, but this panel has been upgraded to modern, more modern instruments and avionics uh, in the interest of both functionality and safety of the aircraft. The section of the B-17 bomber. In flight and during combat, crew members rode up here the bombardier and the navigator. The bombardier sat up front in that seat over the Norden bomb site. The navigator worked at a small table on the left side. Okay, this is the navigator station. This is where the navigator worked. Uh, he had his charts and his maps, and he helped plan the route of flight and keep the bombers uh, on course during the flight. Uh, he also had access to one of the guns uh, that are placed on either side in the nose so that he could help defend the aircraft uh, during, uh, during air attacks and in combat. There's another gun. In the window, there's a handle. That was the remote control for the chin turret, which was mounted up under the nose and was also operated by the crew in the nose of the aircraft. Okay, your current view is through the bomb bay from the pilot's compartment. As you can see, the bomb bay is uh, fairly spacious, but the pathway through the center of the bomb bay is fairly narrow. Uh, to the right and left of the center pathway are the bomb racks. Bombs are placed into the bomb bay and they were hooked into release mechanisms along both sides of the bomb bay. When the bombardier would press the bomb release switch, those racks would sequentially release and the bombs would gravity fall uh, out of the bomb bay uh, out into space. Directly behind the bomb bay is the radio operator's compartment. This compartment was occupied by the radio operator. It was his job to communicate with other aircraft, communicate with the ground, the bases back at home, and maintain uh, any information on the mission and the raid. The compartment is surrounded by radio equipment and amplifiers, and he had a workstation. In the hatchway, directly above, there was a machine gun mounted where the radio operator could remove the hatch and that gun would roll out and he would have access to a gun to help defend the aircraft out of the back of the airplane. Uh, they flew at uh, very high altitudes uh, in large groups and bear in mind that this aircraft is non-pressurized and non-heated. The men that flew in these airplanes were wearing leather suits, wool lined, and in many cases uh, they had heated suits and they would plug themselves into the wall outlets in the aircraft and try to stay warm at these high altitudes. They were also on oxygen because the plane, again, is not pressurized, and they were flying at very high altitudes. Directly behind the door is the ball turret mechanism. The ball turret was a gun that was located in the belly of the airplane. The ball turret gunner was probably one of the more difficult positions on the aircraft. As you can see, by the pictorial diagram we have in here. He was literally laying down. He had uh, gun triggers up over his head. The guns protruded between his feet. 
and he was able to rotate the ball both laterally and vertically with hydraulic controls uh, while he fired at the enemy. While in the turret and sealed in, he was basically trapped and uh, it was very difficult to get out of the ball turret and in an emergency situation uh, it, could be, uh, it could be highly dangerous and almost impossible. The men who flew in the ball turret are uh, very courageous. One of the interesting things I think is that many people in the movies you see the gunners out there with their fingers on the triggers and, and blazing away for long periods of time. In fact, they had extremely limited amounts of ammunition. Total fire time in some cases was around a minute. The wooden boxes on the, on the wall behind the gun was his ammo box and that's all the ammunition that they had. So they would fire in very short bursts at the enemy. They couldn't just hold the thumbs down and, and rattle off long bursts of machine gun fire, otherwise they'd just be out of ammunition. You're looking at the tail gunner's position now. You're looking from the forward hatchway that the crew member would crawl into. He would crawl back in there, sit on a very narrow seat with his head sticking up around the glass and his hands on the gun. And it's his responsibility to protect the rear of the aircraft from enemy attack. This was another one of the isolated positions very much like the ball turret gunner where the crew member was alone and not easily accessible and again in an emergency this position could be very difficult to escape from the aircraft and bail out. Again we're looking at the tail gun position. Tail gunner on this aircraft rode back in the tail. His responsibility was protecting the aircraft from the rear against enemy gunners. Uh, he was sitting on a small seat back there and his head was uh, in the windows and he would be looking out through a gun sight and manipulate the 250 caliber machine guns in the tail to fire at any enemy uh, aircraft coming at him from behind. Now, the position was fairly isolated, it wasn't easy to get out of in the event of an emergency and uh, the people that flew in those were again very courageous as were all the crew members uh, flying in the B-17s. Well as a crew member we're volunteers with the Experimental Aircraft Association and we got involved with this airplane many years ago, most of us. And we really come out here and do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, we come out, of course it's fun being out here and doing what we do, but it's very much to honor the veterans that flew in these airplanes. This airplane touches people in an amazing way and very emotional in many cases. And it's an honor for us to come out and show this airplane and allow these veterans to come out relive some experiences. In many cases say goodbye to their fallen comrades. In many cases they bring their families out to show the grandkids what grandpa did and how he did it. And that is a real privilege for us and a main motivating factor for all of us that participate in the B-17 program.